Thank you for that kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm very proud of the Nevada County Courts for really innovative programs like this one to try to provide legal services. One of the real challenges for California's justice system is that lawyers have become unaffordable. Um, and, and the vast middle class of uh, Californians find it hard to get legal advice when they need it. And Nevada County has put together a number of innovative programs. The Law Library under Vanessa's leadership, the Public Law Center under Helen's leadership, and these seminars, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of them. I want to start with a disclaimer, um, and that is to say that I come to this subject of civil boundary disputes from the perspective of a city attorney, which means a civil boundary dispute usually shows up when one neighbor or another asks the city to help them with a neighbor dispute. So I'm not a lawyer who litigates on behalf of individuals, I don't generally represent individuals, I represent cities and other institutions. So that doesn't give me quite the same perspective as a lawyer who represents real estate brokers or the same perspective as a lawyer who represents litigants. I think that gives me a sort of a neutral and balanced perspective, but I'll let you judge my perspective for yourself while being honest about the fact that we all have perspective. My goal today is to talk about some of the more common kinds of disputes that happen between neighbors around boundary issues to give you some tips about how to avoid a dispute, some tips about how to resolve a dispute, and a little bit of law. Um, I think it's probably most productive if we save the questions till the end. Um, if there's something that's just really burning, um, let me know and I'll, I'll address it. But otherwise, we'll take Q&A at the end. I can get through these materials in a little under an hour, so we should have a good half hour for questions, and we'll be happy to do that. So with no further ado, let's jump into um, our topic. The first problem that creates disputes about boundaries is not knowing where it is. That's actually a fairly common problem in Nevada County because Nevada County was the capital of California at one point. More people lived in Nevada County than anywhere else in California in our heyday and state, and state senators routinely hailed from our little town. And so our property boundaries are old. And so you can buy a piece of property and have your deed say that you own everything from Miller's farmhouse to the nail in the tree in the middle of the Yuba South Crossing. Now, if the Miller's farmhouse ain't been prepared and that tree got washed away, figuring out where your boundary is can be a challenge. The other reason that we have um, more than our fair share of boundary disputes in this county is because we have an agricultural heritage that has recently been transformed by people moving here with more suburban expectations. So if you're a farmer with 160 acres running cattle and your neighbor has 160 acres running horses and that barbed wire line is 10 feet off, what does it matter? And when you're dealing with an agriculture use of 160 acres, you're not going to hire a surveyor to make sure the fence is in the right place. You're going to keep the fence the same place it's always been. Well, when that 160 acres gets divided into 16 ranchettes and folks move up here from the flatland to live there, they really care where that line is. They may be required to survey the line to build their dream house, and suddenly they discover that where the documents, the deed says their line is, and where the fence has always been is someplace else. So that's another reason that we get disputes in this county more than you get somewhere else. If you live in a place like Contra Costa County, where there's a sea of red tile roofs, and each of those lots is exact rectangles punched out in the 1960s on a modern map, you're not going to have the same kinds of issues that we have here. So boundary disputes are, dis are, and it's not because we're more disagreeable than most folks, but we do have our, more than our fair share of boundary disputes here in Nevada County. So the first question to answer is, where is the boundary? There are at least four ways to confirm a disputed boundary. The first is to identify an in-the-field monument tied to a record of survey. Usually this is a little circle of cement with a nail or a brad or a plaque in it. If you're really lucky, you'll have a USGS monument with a little seal of the government. If you find any of those monuments, it's your duty to preserve them. And if you destroy them, it's a crime. And if your, if your neighbor destroys them um, in order to sort of you know, to conceal where the boundary is, that's a crime. So having monuments is a good thing. Knowing where they are and what they mean is a good thing, and preserving them is a good thing. The second way to confirm a boundary is to hire a licensed surveyor. That's not necessarily very cheap. Um, it can be more than $1,000 if it's a... Um, 
depending on how much labor they have to put into it. If it's a small parcel that's recently been surveyed and there's lots of monuments in your neighborhood, easy. So if you're, gonna, if you're in a newer development like one of the three gated communities in our county, it's not going to be too hard to have a survey done. But if you're buying uh, you know, 160 acres out in the country and the deeds are old and they talk about Miller's farmhouse and a brad on a tree in a riverbed, it's going to be more expensive. But a licensed surveyor who does a professional survey and fi files a, a, a record of his or her survey is an excellent way to determine your boundaries. The second, the third way, which is a lot cheaper because it doesn't involve either surveyors or lawyers, is just reach an agreement with your neighbor as to where the boundary is. If the two of you can agree on a boundary, a fence line, the edge of a barn, the middle of a shared driveway, and you document your agreement, that is as good as anything else. You can even record those little agreements, um, and I strongly recommend that. If you've got a cooperative relationship with a neighbor and you're trying to make sure that the problem doesn't become problematic when Maybe they die and leave the property to kids who are more concerned about what it sells for than being a good neighbor. Or maybe you're worried that the relationship won't stay friendly. Or maybe you don't want to get halfway through constructing your dream house to discover they no longer meant it. Having that little agreement in writing and preserving it is a good thing. The last way to do it, and we'll talk about this more, is you can rely on the doctrines of agreed boundaries, prescription, and adverse possession. And these are all common law doctrines, judge-made rules, that I'll unpack a little bit for you as we go on today. More thoughts on boundaries. I told you I had a point of view, and as a government attorney, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that this isn't government's fault. Um, the city or the county has no duty to verify lot line locations when issuing building permits. Sometimes they will. They're not obliged to, and if they get it wrong, you can't sue them. Government Code Sections 818.4 and 818.6, which are aspects of the government claims law, um, say that local governments are immune for injuries arising from a mistake in permit issuance or property inspection. Why is that a good idea? If we had to be responsible for every human error that happens in the building permit and inspecting process, most cities would stop doing a building permit and inspection process. We can't insure all of the real estate in our city or county. That's what title insurance is for. So in order to induce cities to provide this service, we tell them if they make occasional mistakes without malice that they're not liable for it. The Uniform Building Code, a version of which is adopted by every local government in California, puts the burden on the builder to confirm the property line. If you build, you better be darn sure that you're building on your own land and not someone else's, because one of two things will happen if you get it wrong. One is a court might order you to tear it down, which is not a good thing. The other thing is that a court might order you to pay a lot of money to your neighbor to buy the right to leave your house where it is. Um, and there, I give you the citations to the provisions of the California Building Standards the Uniform Building Code is published by a private organization. The state of California adopts a version of it every three years as the state building code. And then with, six months after the state adopts it, local governments have the opportunity to make local amendments. If they don't, at the end of that six-month period, the state version automatically goes into effect. Rather than cite you to the section of each of the local codes, I'm giving you the state site, which should also be the local site unless there's a local amendment. And I'd be shocked if this rule gets amended locally because it doesn't vary from place to place. The other thing to be aware of is that cities and counties do not have any power to determine title to real estate. You may have seen an article in the Union this morning talking about a trail up by Donner Summit that says trail title in dispute. Well, the Board of Supervisors had a meeting about that trail, and they may do some things about that trail, but they're not a court of law. They can't decide who owns that land. Only a court can. Surveys. You should know that the law provides that a licensed surveyor has a right to come on your property to conduct a survey. The owner of the property and any tenants on the property have to be told that he's coming in for that reason, but they can't keep him out. It doesn't mean he can show up in the middle of your dining room at dinner time, um, and it doesn't mean that they can do any damage to your property while coming in. But if you've got cattle fences and gates and locks and the like, you have to accommodate them. The reason for it is that society generally benefits from knowing who owns what and we need to cooperate with one another to make sure that that's possible. A lot line adjustment. It used to be that if you wanted to sell land, you just wrote up a little deed that says, I'm giving you the land described herein. And you record it in the county recorder's office, and you've transferred the land. And that's why we get old deeds that talk about all the land from Miller's farmhouse to a tack and a tree in the riverbed. There were a lot of land frauds that occurred in the 19th century in California and elsewhere where people sold land that they didn't own or sold the same piece twice or um, badly described land. And so we, in order to protect those who buy land, which is eventually most of us, 
um, we adopted something called the Subdivision Map Act. And what the Subdivision Map Act says, and there's a version of it in every state, um, is if you want to divide land into pieces for sale, financing, or leasing, you need a mother may I from the city or the county. And you have to draw a professionally drawn map, you have to depict the parcels, they have to meet the city or the county's requirements, you have to get that filed with the county recorder. And importantly, if you're providing infrastructure like streets and drains, you have to actually provide it before the people try to move in and live there. Um, so the Subdivision Map Act, you can think of it this way. Think of the recorder's office as a big old-fashioned post office with a lot of pigeonholes. And each pigeonhole is a piece of property. And every document you record, a mortgage, a release of a mortgage, with, with respect to that property, needs to go in the right pigeonhole. The Map Act is about creating new pigeonholes, about identifying new saleable units of, of property. There are several ways to, to create units of property through the Map Act, but the one I want to talk about now is called a lot line adjustment. A lot line adjustment is a simple, very simple form of land division. And in order to qualify for this very simple, less expensive, expeditious way, your proposal has to affect fewer than four legal parcels. You cannot create a new parcel. You can't move land between parcels that were not previously contiguous. So if you've got four parcels lined up like this, you can't cut it this way and connect land from that parcel and that parcel because those two parcels didn't use to touch. Um, there's very limited power of the city or the county to say no and very limited power of them to impose conditions. It takes effect when recorded. Why am I telling you all this? If you discover that the fence is 10 feet off of the real property line and nobody has an interest in moving the fence and you want to sell them that strip of land, you process a lot line adjustment to just move the boundary. And when it records and, and takes effect, you get your fee. So a lot line adjustment can be a simple resolution to a dispute, a simple way to sell the land in dispute. The doctrine of agreed boundaries. We are talking today about real property law. Real property law is the oldest law that we apply. Much of it dates from a period of time when guys were battling each other in rusty suits of armor. The reason that we're applying medieval legal principles in the 21st century is that when you change a rule of law about property ownership, you can have the effect of shifting property from one person to another. And the people who own property don't generally take kindly to having it shifted from them to someone else. And generally, people who own property have reasonable access to the people who make rules. So let's say, for example, we had a rule that says the land belongs to the blondes and the water belongs to the redheads. And we wanted to amend that to say the water only belongs to the redheads if they keep their hair dyed into their 70s. Why would the people who aren't redheads anymore feel about losing their water rights because that rule changed? So we don't amend property law very readily, and the property law we apply, as I said, is ancient. Some of it doesn't make sense to us from a modern perspective because it reflects a much earlier, entirely different socioeconomic environment. So this is the first of this really old law that I want to talk about. The doctrine of agreed boundaries is judge-made common law to resolve disputes created by a failure to observe parcel boundaries over time. So if you've got the cattle rancher and the pony farmer who've got their, their fences 10 feet off, and it's been there as long as anyone can remember, and they've acted like it's the right boundary and they've been happy, then the doctrine of agreed boundaries can allow you to get a court to order that that is the boundary, that the boundary was changed by an agreement. It requires a quiet title lawsuit, which means you actually have to file a lawsuit, you need a lawyer, it's not going to be a cheap um, resolution. But it can be a good basis to get a common sense resolution to a dispute arising from a difference between your legal description and time-honored practices between neighbors. There are three elements to proving a case for agreed boundaries. One is the boundary has to be uncertain. So if you've got a surveyed boundary and it's absolutely clear that your fence is 10 feet off, you don't qualify. It's when the boundary says the farmhouse to the tack and a post, where the post is gone. So you have to have an uncertain boundary. There needs to be an express agreement, we actually agreed, either orally in writing, or an implied agreement, implying it from their conduct. Um, usually, there's something called the statute of frauds, which is also ancient law, adopted by an early English parliament that said, in order to transfer land from one person to another, you have to do it in writing. And, it had, and, and the reason for that was it was too easy to, you know, Uncle, Uncle Cedric gets knocked off in one of our medieval wars and both of his nephews claim, oh, he sold it to me for three peppercorns last week. There was so much of that going on, particularly at a period in our history when people died regularly, like during the Black Plague, that 
there was a law that says you can't transfer an interest in real property without a writing. This is an exception to that rule because we imply the agreement from conduct. You also have to acquiesce in the new boundary for five years. So if somebody is encroaching on your property for five years, that's the statute of limitations can be a shorter time, if necessary, to avoid an injustice. So for instance, if it's only been three years, but in that three years you built a nice barn and put a lot of money in it and brought the cattle in, and it would be unjust to, to ask you to tear the bar barn down because people have conducted themselves as though that was the real boundary for three years, you don't have to. And I'd give you some citations. If the parties can agree on an outcome, it is a good idea not only to have a written agreement, but to record it. There are two reasons to record documents. One is that you can't lose it. The recorder is in the business of preserving documents forever. The second is it gives notice to third parties, like if your next door neighbor dies, leaves it to the nephew, and the nephew doesn't want to be as agreeable as the uncle was. It's of record. He has legal notice of it. He can't deny it. Next doctrine. This isn't agreed boundaries. This is adverse possession and prescription. A person can obtain title to another person's property by adverse possession. And they can obtain an easement, the right to use a piece of someone else's property, uh, over another person's land by prescribing that interest. It's ancient law designed to re reward squatters who put land to productive use during the Black Plague. In our world, rewarding squatters doesn't sound like a great idea. But when you're having trouble feeding people because most of the agricultural workers have been wiped out by the bubonic plague, putting land to productive use was very much in the interest of people who made laws, none of whom worked with their hands for a living, and did buy food that other people made. So in the context of the 13th century crisis in Europe, this law made perfect sense. We still live with it today. There are a few modern refinements, and we'll talk about those. Here are the elements of adverse possession. A trespasser, meaning you're there without the right to be there, occupies the land hostily, that means without um, claiming that you're licensing it or allowing it, they're just there because they've chosen to, chosen to trespass on your land. Openly, it can be seen to the public that they're doing it, exclusively and continuously. So Farmer Brown dies, Squatter Nick moves in, sets up house there, everybody in the village knows he's living there, he's there for five years, never claims to own it, At the end of the five years, it's his farm. Okay, the period is now five years that's set forth in the Civil Code, and there was a time in California when the most powerful political interest was Southern Pacific Railroad. And Southern Pacific Railroad owned a lot of federally patented land, including you know, a 40-mile swath through the middle of the Mojave Desert and places that they could not easily supervise. They could not protect themselves from squatters efficiently. So they, because they owned the legislature at the time, passed themselves a little law that says in order to get adverse possession of fee interest, ownership, full title in California, you've got to pay the taxes too. That made it possible for Southern Pacific just to keep track of 58 county tax collectors rather than actually patrolling all of their lands in California. So if you're trying to get ownership of land in fee, meaning absolute fee, simple title, absolute, you need to pay the taxes which means that adverse possession is mostly a dead letter in California. Not too many of us are paying taxes on somebody else's property. But it not only applies to land, it applies to water, it applies to mineral rights, any interest in land. So for instance, if you're taking water from a stream and it turns out you don't have the right to take water from that stream, but the county tax collector thinks you do and is assessing you for it and you paid the taxes for five years, you probably adversely possessed the interest to take water from that stream. Prescription of an easement is much more common because it does not require that you pay taxes. You can prescribe an easement by making use of an interest in land, usually an easement such as a driveway, a walkway, a wall, a fence, hostily, openly, and continuously for five years. So if somebody blazes a trail across your property to get to their back 40 without your permission, and they do it openly for five years, they have the right to do it forever. This can be useful in resolving disputes because back in a simpler time, the 160-acre horse farmer and the 160-acre uh, cattle rancher often traded access rights between themselves in a very informal way. In an agricultural world, it wasn't so important to know who was using a dirt road when it was only getting two truck trips a year. In a more 
a modern environment when truck trips rattling by your windows five feet away is an annoying thing and makes you feel insecure and you want it to stop, it's a different set of expectations. So this notion of prescription of easements can help you resolve disputes. Somebody says, prove to me in writing you've got a right to use my driveway, and you can't because nobody ever wrote it down. All you have to prove is you've been doing it openly, hostily, and for five years. Well, how do you protect yourself from somebody doing that to you? Well, there's two ways. Uh, the most expensive way is to hire a lawyer to sue them in trespass to get a judge to order them to stop. I don't recommend that. The other, which can work for a lot of people, is to license it. Tell them in writing, I will let you use the driveway until I decide otherwise. Love your friendly neighbor. If you've given them permission and can prove it, it's no longer hostile. It's licensed, and you can revoke the license whenever you need to. So if you're worried about somebody taking an interest away from you, and you don't want to get into a fight with your neighbor, and you don't want to hire a lawyer, but you also don't want to have a permanent driveway on your property that might be used by other people later that you don't know and don't trust, this is a real good solution. Just license it. Do it in writing, even if it's an email. But preserve that writing, because you'll, you'll need it to prove it. So, it doesn't have to be exclusive, because that's the nature of easements, driveways are shared. It doesn't ha you don't have to pay the taxes. And, but the rights you get are only the rights you actually use. So let's say the pony rancher drives his feed truck out to the pony meadow once a month. If he wants to divide the pony ranch into 16 houses and have seven vehicle trips a day per house, that's called surcharging the easement. So somebody who's trying to develop based on a prescribed easement usually can't. They only get the right to continue to do that thing which they have been doing. So if the road is one lane wide and they want it to be two lanes wide, they've got to show they made it two lanes wide for five years. If they are relying on a prescriptive easement, you only get what you used. Adverse possession and prescription, a little more on this subject. Here's my advice. To prevent adverse possession and prescription, license the use by giving the users written permission and stating that you reserve the right to revoke the permission. And you can say that in a very friendly way. You can say, John, I know you've been using our shared driveway to get your back 40. I'm happy to let you continue doing that. If it becomes a problem, I will let you know. Well, to a lawyer, that says, I'm reserving the right to kick you off my land. But to a layperson, that may sound like a very friendly thing to say. Yes, sir? Say if somebody's been using it for 5, 10, 15 years, and all of a sudden they write, they write a license. Uh, what are you going to say? Receive the license. If the neighbor, if your neighbor says to you, I'm going to let you continue using the back 40, the road to the back 40, and you believe you already have a prescriptive license, then you need to write back and say, thank you for being so neighborly, but I don't think I need your permission. You need to tell them in writing that you think you have the right. Because if you acquiesce in their, in their notice, you can impair your rights to continue to use the prescriptive easement. These affect the title to the property itself. So the new person's going to be bound. Um, if, the, if the neighbor had the rights, they've got the rights against the present owner, the future owner, and everybody into the future. There may be a disclosure issue. Your seller may have had a duty to disclose to you. Your broker and their broker may have had a duty of disclosure. And if you're harmed by that non-disclosure, you have rights against them. There are two kinds of surveys in California. There's a California Land Title Association form of title insurance report. Two kinds of title insurance in California. The other is called the American Land Title Association. A CLTA, which is the most common, um, does not require anybody to go visit the property. All they do is look at the documents of record in the recorder's office. An ALTA requires somebody to actually visit the property to look for signs of prescription, like recently used dirt roads. So if you're in a development scenario, you're normally going to want an ALTA survey. If you're in a residential survey, when you're looking at the land, look at, look at the property. If you see roads on it, ask about them. Ask about them. And if you're selling a property, be aware you may have a duty to, that you do have a duty to disclose any of these prescribed rights against you. How long, how much time do you have to enforce this public notice? You know, there's this road, the private road, and you're not be able to use it after so and so time. How much time do you Five have? years. See, if you have the right because you prescribe it against them, okay. and they prescribe it against you by blocking it, then you have five years. You have five years. Works both ways. Yeah. Okay. Question. Yes, sir. California put a limit on the uh, time which the can ripen? Sure, it's just, the five years rule is a statute which uh, could be changed. A, a date beyond which prescriptive uh, easement the use of the trail. Um, you cannot prescribe against government. No, the, 
And um, so if you're trying to prescribe access to an inholding in the National Forest, for example, and you want to prescribe a trail, you can't. Why can't you prescribe against government? Because government property, public property, is generally open to the public. So your use of it is not hostile. Your use of it is as a member of the public. So you generally can't prescribe against the government. Where the government will try to limit your use of trails is usually via the environmental laws or via the government's entitlement to manage its own property. So there are often disputes are frequently brought by the Pacific Legal Foundation and other conservative nonprofit legal advocacy organizations about access to inholdings in the National Forest. There was one that came down from the Ninth Circuit last week in which a guy wanted to bring bulldozers onto his property to level a burned cabin and rebuild, and he needed to get through a National Forest to do it, and the bridge had washed out, and it had been t seven years since the bridge had washed out, and while people had clearly taken bulldozers in before, they hadn't taken them in recently. And the Ninth Circuit said that the federal government had the ability to prevent the guy from bringing bulldozers in. He had to figure out a way to build a cabin, probably by helicopter. And we're dealing with you know, tundra and environmental resources and all that stuff. But when you're talking about federal land and state land, there's a complicated set of law there that I'm, I'm not really in a position to cover in much depth today. Yes, sir? The uh, easement that's reported on the uh, plot plants, and the lack of a better word, on the property line, uh, the easement shows uh, 20 foot. Uh, if you've got an easement of record, then you own that easement of record. But um, in t interpreting title documents can be tricky. Um, you need to read the words on the face of the deed very closely. If they say, I'm granting you an easement 20 feet wide along the northern property line, and they record it, you own that easement. That's real property, and you can buy and sell it. But if the map that created your neighborhood says, the streets depicted on this map, some of which aren't built yet, are hereby offered to dedication to the public, that's an offer of dedication. It's not a grant of an easement. And those offers expire unless um, exercised within 25 years. So you, you might remember that there was some coverage in the paper where the county board of supervisors had accepted offers of dedication of some private streets in the county before the 25 years lapsed, and then they regretted it and vacated those streets and gave them back. That was that 25-year rule uh, operating. Okay. Yes. So are you getting are you grant means you got it. An offer to dedicate means you have the right to acquire it later, usually by improving it and using it. Now, if somebody posts a, a public notice that they're going to try to prescribe their property and it's been used for like 10, 15 years, and, and you would post yours as a public notice, would that be enough to offset their no public notice? If somebody declares a street private or gates it, when you believe that you have prescriptive rights, my best advice to you is consult a lawyer. B a battle of signs is probably not going to accomplish a lot. Okay. Fences and walls, another uh, fruitful area for dispute. First piece of advice about fences and walls, and we'll, we'll take more Q&A at the end. Um, first thing you need to know is that you might need a zoning approval from your city or county, particularly if your fence or wall is someplace where somebody can see it. We make a big distinction in local government between property line walls, front yard walls, and what are called garden walls. A garden wall is just sort of deep in your property somewhere. It doesn't affect anybody else. If they're lower than six feet, they don't need a footing. They don't need a building permit. But if they're taller than six feet, you're going to need a building permit and a structural section and that sort of thing. But be aware that you just can't go out and build a fence. And don't believe the fence salesman when he says, oh, yeah, I can sell you 20,000 yards of fence and there's no problem here. Call the planning permit county and ask, and they will tell you what their rules are. The rules are going to be more restrictive in, in town than they are out in the country. Uh, CCNRs may apply. So, for example, in the track that I live in over by Wildwood, you can't build a front yard fence. CCNR say you can't do it because they want to maintain an open look to the community. Um, the city and the county is not uh, obligated to enforce their rules. They can make a mistake. So if somebody builds a fence along your property line, they didn't have a permit and they were supposed to have one, and you say to the city, go do something about this, they can say no. They don't have to fix that for you. And often we don't fix that for you because we've got limited resources and we're generally interested in solving problems that affect a lot of people, not something that affects one person. So if your neighbor starts to build a fence, you should may, pay attention and make sure that you speak before it's too late. And typically, a public agency cannot enforce CCNRs. 
So, for instance, if a front yard fence that's four feet tall is legal under the county, county code, and it is, I can build that four-foot fence in complete violation of my neighbor's rights under the CCNRs, and the county's not entitled to do anything about it. My neighbors are. My homeowners association is. I'll get fined, but the county can't fix that. Okay. If you build on a property line, make sure you know where the property line is. Do a survey, look for a marker. Because if you give land away, you gave it away. If you trespass, you might have to build that fence or wall twice. It is a good idea to build the wall or fence a couple of inches on your side of the line so that you can own and control the whole thing. If you put it exactly on the line, it can become what's called a party wall, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then you can't alter it without the consent of your neighbor. So if you want to own and control your fence, put it a couple inches on, on, on your side of the line, and then it doesn't hurt to send a friendly email to the neighbor saying, Dear Marge, I put this about six inches on my side of the line so I can make sure I do my good neighborly duty of maintaining both sides of the wall, but I ain't giving you six inches of my land either. You can make that a friendly sort of a thing, but put it in writing and preserve it. If you get it wrong and build on their land, technically you've committed a civil wrong called a trespass. You could lose ownership to the structure, and they could force you to tear it out. So if you're building a fence or a wall, be careful. What about replacing an existing fence or wall? Um, generally, that's a fairly low risk proposition. If you're putting exactly the same thing in exactly the same place, you're not really altering the status quo. Personally, I wouldn't do it without talking to my neighbor. I would, maybe you're going to talk to them about sharing the cost. Maybe you're going to make sure they don't have any objections. But it's sort of a neighborly thing to do, to talk to your neighbor before you do something on the boundary line. And for all you know, they may want to chip them with you and put up a nicer, grander fence. But it's better to have that conversation chase out of the woodwork any issues that you're going to have to deal with and deal with them. Um, but if you, you know, if, if you can't find the neighbor or um, if they're just not somebody that you're able to talk to, if you build exactly what was there in the same place at the same time, you're generally not violating any rules that haven't been violated previously. Okay. Division fences. A division fence is a fence that is intended to mark a boundary. This is fairly common in ag country, less common um, in the big city. If it is a division fence, and that's a question of proof, you know, what did the parties intend when they built it, then both parties have a duty to maintain it. And the, the civil code says coterminous, people who are but owners, are mutually bound equally to maintain the boundaries and monuments between them and the fences between them. Thus, neither one can remove it without the other's agreement, and you're supposed to share the cost of maintenance. If your neighbor doesn't pay, in theory, theory you could go fix it yourself and send them a bill for half of it. If they don't pay you, you're probably ending up at small claims court. If your neighbor will not cooperate, you may repair it yourself and sue for reimbursement, perhaps in small claims court. Party wall. A party wall is a boundary wall that is intended to be part of a structure. The best example of this is in a big city where they've got zero lot line buildings like um, in San Francisco down in the old part of the city, you've got one wall that's holding up two buildings. Well, both property owners own that wall. Um, they can exist where it's a shared retaining wall as well, but they're much more common in, in a building setting. Party walls should be created by written agreement, so you know who's paying for what and when they're paying for it and what people's rights are. Some of the more common disputes is you've got a party wall, three-story structure, three-story structure, and these people want to add a fourth story. These people worry that it's going to surcharge the wall. It's good to have those issues covered by an agreement. If a written agreement exists, it controls the rights and duties of the party. If there's no agreement, the law will imply an agreement. They will find a mutual easement, and they will, they will sort of figure out what reasonable people would have agreed to um, had reasonable people been present, and reasonable people usually aren't present, otherwise you wouldn't be in court. Changes to a party wall are permissible, provided that there's no harm to the other property, and there's no violation of the agreement. And here's a couple of cases from the early 1900s, which tells you how old this law is. Yes, sir. Uh, say you own the building, and you own the complete building, the brick building, and both of your neighbors have come to your outside wall and, and went against your outside wall. Say I want to tear my building down, or if I had a fire and lost my building, the two neighbors do not have a wall. Where do we go there? Right? No. Uh, if, if you're holding their building up, which you may well be, and you have been holding their building up for more than five years, they have a right to have you continue to hold their building up. So you have to provide the bracing to replace your structure. That's the simple answer. 
Because there's enough money at stake in that situation, you don't want the simple answer, you want a real estate lawyer. I try not to make that the answer, but occasionally that's the answer. Does, does that mean I have to? You have to brace their structures. You have to brace their structures. Sometimes you'll walk by a vacant lot and you'll see like uh, I-beams connecting two buildings. Those I-beams are holding those other two buildings up because the people in the middle took their building out. They have a duty. It's called a, it's called an, a right to lateral and subjacent support, and it can be prescribed against you. Generally speaking, you want a party wall agreement. You want to have, when somebody's building zero lot line, you want an agreement with the other party. What you're entitled to do is when they go in to build, you're entitled to insist that they build a structure that doesn't require support so that you're not obliged to support it later. And a modern building is going to be constructed in such a way anyway because the building department doesn't want to deal with that fight. They want the building to stay standing. They don't want it to fall down. We get into this situation when you're dealing with older buildings, which, of course, we have here. That's one of the reasons we choose to live here, and these issues come up. But, but both of the neighbors, both of the neighbors have done their building, and I didn't yep. There's one, well, the, if, if the buildings are modern um, or were recently reconstructed, they may not be leaning on you. So before you call the real estate lawyer, call our structural engineer. If the structural engineer tells you we can tear that building down with no reasonable harm, I would share that structural engineer's report with the neighbors and tell them they might want to get their own report, but you intend to rely on yours and you're moving forward. But you better be sure your, insur your engineer is right, and you better be sure that his E&O insurance is current, because if he gets it wrong and you knock a building down, you want him to pay for it. Okay, next topic. Spite fences. Every now and then, the name for a legal doctrine is sort of ripe and pungent and tells you exactly what it's talking about. A spite fence is any fence or other structure in the nature of a fence, meaning a line of trees, unnecessarily exceeding 10 feet in height, maliciously erected or maintained for the purpose of annoying the owner or occupant of adjoining property. Such a fence is a private nuisance. Any owner or occupant of adjoining property injured either in his comfort or the enjoyment of his estate, I love this 19th century language, by such nuisance may enforce the remedies against its continuance by filing a lawsuit. So you cannot put up a line of cypress trees and put lots of miracle grow on them for the purpose of destroying your neighbor's view. If a spite fence is shorter than 10 feet, it can still be proven to be a spite fence if you can show a motive to injure your neighbor. So a row of eucalyptus trees was found in 1944 to have been a spite fence. There's a more modern case in which somebody planted a row of trees in order to destroy his neighbor's view of Mount Shasta that was found to be a spite fence, and they had to come out. Protection of views. Another important concern in a, in a community as beautiful as ours. In general, you have a right to block a view or sunlight, as long as you're not acting maliciously. So if somebody's had a lovely view across your vacant lot for the last 10 years, and bought their house because of it, and would love to continue to have that lovely view, they better buy your property, because you have a right to put a house on it. Now, many local governments who don't like that ancient law have adopted view protection ordinances, and if you have what's defined as a view lot, you need a mother may I from the local government that's usually designed to strike an appropriate balance between you using your land and the neighbors having as good a view as they can have in light of you still using your land reasonably. Um, I don't know whether any of the four local governments in this county have view protection ordinances. I'd be surprised that's more of a wealthy suburb kind of thing rather than out in the country kind of thing. Um, so there's a case here, Sherer versus Lederman from 1988, which says allowing trees to grow to defeat passive solar features of a house was not a nuisance. As I said, local ordinances can and do provide otherwise. If you're trying to build that vacant lot, you're probably going to want to talk to a uh, planning department before you buy the lot. There is uh, recent statutes that are of interest to folks here who do have solar. Um, and the Solar Shade Control Act says that solar systems used for power, water, and space heating are protected from shadows cast by plants on neighboring property. But we're talking about active solar systems. We're not talking about a, a path of solar mass with a glass house around it. We're talking about active systems here. Trees and shrubs can't be planted or allowed to grow so as to block more than 10% of the solar collector if the collectors are set back from the property line as required by the law. I think it's, it's like 20 feet. So if the, if the collectors are set back from the line, your neighbor can't put a line of trees along the, uh, the, the edge of his property to block your solar collectors. Um, timberland and commercial agricultural is exempted. So 
so they can actually replant um, a Christmas tree farm right up to the edge of the property line. Um, and maybe you want to buy those trees every five years, but you can't force them um, not to plant them there. Trees and branches, another issue that comes up. Okay, a tree is generally owned by the owners of the land on which it is located. You buy the land, you buy the tree. So trees whose trunks stand wholly upon the land of one owner belong exclusively to him, although their roots grow into the land of another. So if the, if the, if the trunk's on your land, it's your tree, even if the roots and branches reach across the property line. If the tree is on the property line, it's owned jointly. And, and Stephen Field in 1850s wrote this code for us. Trees whose trunks stand partly on the land of two or more coterminous owners belong to them in common. Neither owner may alter a jointly owned tree so as to harm another. So we've got a case from 1936 in which a citrus grove owner could trim but not remove a neighboring grove owner's windbreak trees. If, somebody t if you've got a big tree, these things are large structures exposed to wind loads. And the reason they don't fall over is partly their root structure and partly their own internal balance. And if you shave the stride of a tree, it's going to do that. Actually, it's going to do that. You cannot trim a tree so as to harm it, kill it, or cause it to collapse. But you can reasonably trim what's on your side of your line. One, encroaching trees. That's the most common. An encroaching tree is a tree that you own, but its branches and roots are going across the line onto your neighbor's land. The traditional rule, and property law does change sometimes, particularly when it doesn't cause large changes in property rights. The traditional rule allowed the owner of the property on which the tree encroached to trim it to the property line, even if that killed the tree. As long as you didn't trespass. If you, didn't, if you could kill the tree on, by staying on your property, you're entitled to do it. That's not the law anymore. That law makes sense in an agricultural environment. It does not make sense in an urban environment. The current rule is that you must behave reasonably. So if there are roots under your property and you need to cut a root in order to get a foundation in for something you're entitled to build, you can do that if you act reasonably. If you need to cut branches so they're not scraping on your roof and tearing the tiles off, you can do that provided that you act reasonably. Generally, it's, what I suggest you do is talk to your neighbor and say, you know, I'm putting a wall in, need to cut one of the roots, is that okay with you? Just talk to folks. A little advanced communication can resolve a lot of disputes. If you can't talk to the neighbor or talking to them was an unpleasant experience, then my advice, if you're trying to avoid a dispute, is get an arborist to tell you that what you're planning to do won't hurt the tree. And then act consistently with the arborist report, and then you're going to win your case if you get sued, because it's perfectly clear that you tried and did act reasonably. If a tree is clearly on another property, and a branch falls, or part of the tree falls, and damages your property, I was told that that's your problem. Uh, I think that is your problem for two reasons. One is you're insured for that. If you've got homeowner's insurance, you're protected. And so it makes sense for it to be your responsibility. So you've got one insurance company in the fight, not two. And secondly, because you have the power to reasonably trim the branches on your side of the line. If the tree is really on somebody else's property, totally. If the tree, it's, it's, if the tree collapses onto your house, it's, it's not your responsibility because you didn't have the right to go on their land to deal with it. But if a branch falls on your house, you are allowed to trim that branch. So you're responsible for the things you have power over, and you're not responsible for things you don't have power over. So the tree on another property tips over. You're, you're still insured for it, and I'd start with calling my insurer and let them decide if they want to sue my neighbor, so I'm not in the position of doing that, because I do have to live there. Um, but in theory, if the tree collapses, the tree can collapse in one of two scenarios. One scenario is they were negligent. They knew or had reason to know that the tree was unstable, didn't do anything about it, and that those chickens came home to roost. That's actionable. They owe you. Their homeowner's insurance owes you. If no reasonable person could have known that tree was going to suddenly collapse and that was a surprise, then it's just an accident and nobody's responsible for it. The rule is did you act reasonably. And there are certain kinds of trees that are known to sudden limb drop. Um, and, and, and the arborist will tell you not to plant those. But if you got one, you can never know when the branches are going to come down. Other plants, like eucalyptus trees, are fairly known not to withstand strong wind loads. And if you got some old eucalyptus trees that are leaning a little bit and winter season's coming, you might want to talk to an arborist about that, particularly if uh, there's an expensive house underneath them. Okay. Um, the, as I said, the current rule is that trimming of trees or roots must be reasonable. This is a quote from a case, and I like to read this to you because it gives you a strong sense of the attitude of judges towards these disputes. Judges do not like these disputes 
because these are the kind of disputes that most of us manage to avoid in our lives by talking to our neighbors and acting reasonably. So usually when these cases get to court, it's because somebody was not being reasonable. And the judicial attitude towards such cases is an effort to identify who was unreasonable. Very occasionally, we get two people who are equally um, un uh, unreasonable, and those are the ones that end up um, being litigated like Bleak House until there's no money to pay the lawyers anymore. Apparently, this is one of those rows between neighbors in which the defendants are standing on what they erroneously believe to be their strict legal rights to the exclusion of any consideration of the fair, decent, neighborly, and legal thing to do. Okay, options for a property owner affected by a encroaching tree. My first option is to ask your neighbor to trim it, or ask them if they would mind you trimming it. I wouldn't touch somebody else's tree without talking to them first. If that's not an option or that option isn't fruitful, trim it reasonably on your own property. And as I said, if you're worried about a fight, hire an arborist to tell you what's prudent to do and do exactly what they tell you and not more or less. You can also sue for damages for an injunction if it can be proved that the tree is a nuisance as where it's damaging a foundation. So if you need to take the tree out to protect yourself because it's undermining your foundation and the neighbor won't cooperate, I wouldn't take the tree out. I would, um, I would get a lawyer to have a court persuade me that I've got a right to do that if I can't persuade the neighbor to do it. Tree trimming. Um, cities regulate tree trimming. Um, and uh, you've, you've seen articles recently about a uh, long discussion in Nevada City. Uh, of course, most discussions in Nevada City are long, I think. Um, participa participatory democracy at its best. Um, about revisiting their tree protection ordinance. You saw the story in the paper last year about the really large tree that came out in Grass Valley, much to the chagrin of people who, who loved that old tree. We like trees, and we protect them. So don't do anything major to a tree, particularly if it's something like an oak or a walnut, a native tree unless you check with your planning department first to make sure that you don't need a permit. Typically, maintenance of a tree you can do without a permit, but any lacing, limbing, trunking, topping, destroying is going to require a permit from the city. So the city or a county can trim and remove a tree at your expense if it's blocking a public right-of-way. So if you block a public street, we can open that street and send you a bill. CCNRs typically give homeowners associations the right to do the same thing. But the flip side is that cities and counties that own trees, like parkway median trees um, and trees and parks, can be liable for the damages their trees do to sidewalks, buildings, and sewer lines. So we have the right to control the public trees. We're responsible for them as well. And nobody gets to block a street. The question was, is this, does the city have to give me notice and an opportunity to fix a tree before they come fix it for me? Um, the, the, the lawyerly answer is it depends. Um, if you're actually blocking a street and creating a hazard, they can fix the hazard PDQ. Um, if it's less of a problem, uh, then they should give you notice. Generally, they will because you're a registered voter and they'd like to keep you happy. And generally, they will because it's easier to, to induce you to comply than to fix it and try to chase you for the money. Yes. Does someone have the right to cut down uh, a tree that's, um, that's on the off property that is uh, that, um, to, to gain access to? No. The, to if the tree is on your property, you own the tree. And if they cut it down, there. That's a, that's both a crime and a civil wrong. Oh, okay. Drainage disputes. Next topic where we get disputes among property owners about how we handle water. And up here in. Uh, in the foothills where we get a lot of rain at times. Uh, any of you went down to the river that Saturday after New Year's, you can see what those rivers are capable of doing. Uh, the old rule was that the lower property hill, property owner, had to accept runoff from the higher property. But the higher property owner could not increase the flow beyond natural levels. That made perfect sense in an agricultural setting. In an urban environment, almost everything we do increases flow. Every time you build a roof, or lay a patio, or change the, um, or, or create hardscape. There's less percolation and more flow. And so this rule doesn't work in modern society, and I'll tell you the modern rule in a moment. But here's a quote from an old Merced case, 1957. The owner of the upper or dominant estate has the legal and natural easement or servitude in the lower or servient estate to discharge all surface waters naturally falling or accumulating on his land 
upon or over the land of the servient owner in the manner which they would naturally flow from a higher to a lower level. And the owner of the lower estate is answerable in damages for any injury which might be caused to the upper estate by reason of obstruction which he has placed in the way of such natural flow, thus causing it to back up or remain on the land of the upper property owner. So you can't block the water course to create sort of a beaver dam and flood the, the guy uphill, which was sort of reasonable in an agricultural environment. This proved impractical in the modern era. The modern rule is that all property owners must take reasonable care to avoid injury to adjacent land by surface water flows. And the person who alters the natural flow must act with care. So if you're doing any alterations to the drainage on your property, you should be very careful. If you're just restoring riprap that was always there, that's probably not a big deal. If you're just cleaning out a ditch that uh, has been sedimented to where, the way it was before, that's probably not a big deal. If you are rerouting the drainage across your property, if you're cutting a new V ditch, if you're trying to create waterfalls um, on your backyard, my very strong suggestion is don't do that without consulting a civil engineer so that you can uh, make sure that you don't need a grading permit from the county and you can make sure that you can prove that you didn't act in a way that caused harm to a neighbor. Relevant factors in such disputes are the harm caused, the foreseeability of that harm, and the motive. So if you're just trying to protect your property and it didn't occur to you that um, cleaning out the sediment was actually going to expose some really erosive soil and flood your neighbor with mud, that's probably one thing. If you were trying to um, create a view amenity, a nice beaver pond in the backyard, end up flooding their, their meadow while doing it, that's going to be viewed differently. So again, if you're doing anything rather than maintaining what exists, and it's anywhere near the property line or likely to affect how the water flows in and off your property, my advice is consult a civil engineer and think about whether you need a permit from the city or the county. Yes, ma'am. It's relatively short. I think it, it's certainly not longer than five years. It could be as short as three. Okay, so I would need to be, even though I, it was done prior to purchasing the property, so I'd need to find out when it was built. First, I, the first thing, I'd, when it was built, whether your predecessors entitled, people who sold you your house, agreed to it. Um, okay. And, whether the, and of course, there's the question of whether they disclosed the problem to you. If the problem exists when you bought and they didn't disclose, then they, may, they and their broker and your broker might be liable to you. The reason I raise that issue is it gives them an incentive to cooperate with you in proving that, that it's the, that the other folks' problem and not yours. And one way to approach such a problem is to talk to a civil engineer just to get a sense of what, whether they think the behavior on the other side of the line was reasonable or not and what they think the fix is. Well, it was, it was hearsay created by a builder who built another piece of property kind of up to me. Right. It's, uh, it's, uh, and another reason to start by talking to a civil, you don't have to buy thousands of dollars of, of legal service, of professional services from a civil engineer, but just have an initial consultation, is they may end up telling you, you know, the right fix here is a couple thousand dollars between the two properties. That puts you in a position to go to your neighbor and say, you know, I've got a problem, and quite frankly, I think you're going to have a problem, and my civil tells me that we can make both of our properties a little more secure if we cooperate on this project you want to cooperate, or you want to let me build the piece I need to build on your side of the line. So you might want to talk to a civil first so you know what the scope of your problem is and what your solution is, and then as I said, in all of these situations, my, my very best advice is start by talking to your neighbor, because when people talk to each other often, they come to a, a good outcome. Let me talk about my last slide, which doesn't take long, and then we'll open it for Q&A. The basic rule of all of this area of the law is reasonableness and fairness. And there's a civil code section back from 1854 that tells us so, or 1879, I guess. One must so use his own rights so as not to infringe upon the rights of another. So your land, your 40 acres, your castle is yours to command as you will, provided that you're not unreasonably harming a neighbor. And you can expect your neighbors not to unreasonably, no, uh, unreasonably harm you. So I'm out of uh, slides, but you're probably not out of questions, so fire away. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a new word that I didn't understand. Uh, I have two pieces of property that all have barbed wire things. I thought that was the property line, and now I find out, I can see it nowhere in writing, I went and got all the documentation, and they're saying that they have to have a 15 or 20 foot of that. So the two parts of 
my question is, I don't know what the offset is, where it's written, or what uh, right they have between the offset and my easement. An offset just means a distance from something. So if you set a fence back from the property line, it is offset from the line by whatever that distance is. Um, there's no general law requiring offsets from easements. The scope of, one, of your rights in an easement is going to be from one of two sources. First is the text of the easement document itself. If you don't have a copy of it, pull out the title insurance report that you received when you bought the property. And that will say, you've got good, clean title of the property with except the next 178 listed things, starting with property taxes. On that list of anywhere from six to 700, depending on how old the property is, exceptions to title, you should find a recorded easement. You can go to the county recorder and say, I want this document. And they will, they'll dig it out and give it to you. Read the easement and see what it says. If there is no recorded easement, and it doesn't sound like your facts, the way you phrase the question leads me to believe you probably have an, an easement of record. But if there is no recorded easement, then we're in a prescription situation. Which rights did they enjoy for five years open and hostily? And that can be hard to know. But start, start by looking at your title insurance. Yes, sir. Uh, on this drainage, we have a uh, limited service district, and the road is the hill comes down, and the road is not like this to go around it. And it's been there since 1904. The people that have bought the uphill part of the property have, have been there about 20 years. But it's eroding. Mm -hmm. and I don't think it started, I don't know when it started. But anyhow, it's eroding because of the cut. There. It's proper drainage on the uh, road itself to go under the road and off downhill. They want us to do something to fix the... They want the CSD to, to pay to solve the problem? Um, if the erosion is coming within your right-of-way, you're responsible for it. If it's coming upslope from your right-of-way on their private property, they have a duty not to block your road. So it depends on where the erosion is coming from. My, my guess is that it's coming from the whole slope, your piece and their piece, and it's probably mostly their responsibility. On the other hand, that doesn't get your problem solved. The fact you can say this is your problem doesn't get the road cleared. Now, if you don't care that the road's not clear, that ain't your problem. But if you're trying to get the road cleared, you may need to have some... Uh, the, road is, the road is clear. There's no problem. The erosion is coming down from their property, going into a drainage ditch with culverts under the road, so that the road stays clear and dry, clear uh, with the runoff. But they're complaining that because we put the road there in 1904, no, they're, respon they're responsible for the slope. But what I will tell you is that if you own that road as the district, you are responsible for any injury caused by an unreasonably dangerous condition of the road. If the road's not draining properly, and you're either creating a, a way for people to spin out and kill themselves, or you're flooding somebody's property, that might be the district's legal responsibility. I would start by asking the district's engineer, are we, is this unsafe? And if it's not unsafe, then the folks up the hill need to fix the slope, not you. I are the engineer. There you go. You can decide whether it's unsafe or not. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, in a lot line, of, I just want to be clear, in a lot line adjustment, you're actually changing the legal description. Correct. Two parts is involved. Correct. That would involve the city, right? Correct. To do that and get a, 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 get a like surveyor to redefine the property. Right. And easement. Okay, that also changes the tax. That's right. It does have tax consequences. It does. Could change if people have loans on the property, the bank has to agree to let you do that. But, right? That's right. Yeah. But on an easement, who's involved? Um, generally speaking, you can create an easement over any property that you own fee title to without consulting other folks with an interest in your property unless you contractually agreed not to. So generally speaking, you can allow somebody to put a driveway across your back and it's a bit between... Well, the easement is recorded against their property for the benefit of your property. It will probably, it doesn't always show up in, in the chain of title to your property unless you make it so. And so you may want to record a, a memorandum of easement in the chain of title to your property. Technically, the easement is in chain of title to the other property. It's a good idea to do the memo so that it'll show up. Uh, to see how uh, helpful the, uh, the county recorder is. Sometimes the county recorder will give you a cover sheet and work it through for you. Sometimes they're going to say, that's legal advice and I can't help you. But if you've got a reasonably clear easement that describes the properties affected, I'd start with the recorder and see how far I get. Yes, sir. On the light, light, light line uh, adjustment, um, parcels are the limiting factors as opposed to acreage? Correct. So uh, unlimited acreage is going to be less than four parcels. You can move a 10-foot strip from a 160-acre parcel 
You can move a 10-foot strip from a quarter-acre parcel. It doesn't matter, as long as you're not creating a new development site. 10-foot strip, but I mean, suppose you wanted to do a lot line adjustment that takes in 10 acres. Sure. You can do that. Okay. Second question. Um, if we have pre-proposition 13 taxes and we do a lot line adjustment, will that trigger a reassessment of our tax situation? I think the answer is no, but I'm not sure enough for you to take that to the bank or for the county to take that to the bank. i call the assessor's office. They'll tell you. Okay. Yes, sir. Are they using it? They have used it against my will. And, and have they been using it for five years? No. Then you better block it or license it or get a lawyer. And because if you, if you acquiesce for five years, you've given them the right to continue using it. And what happens if they tear down the, the, uh, the obstruction? If they tear down the obstruction and a court concludes they had a prescriptive right, they're in the right. If they tear down the obstruction and a court concludes that they were just trespassers, then you have two claims against them, one for trespass and one for damaging your, your, your barriers. But you need to be very sure as to what you can prove. And so if you've not lived there yourself for the last five years and can't personally testify to what's happened for five years, then you might want to consult a lawyer before you start down that path. But do a title search. Do a title search on your property and on theirs. Yes, sir. When you use the word continuously, you guys can the period. How continuously is that thing once a week, once a month, once a year? There's sort of two ways to answer that. The, f the first, um, which is most technically, ac technically accurate and not very helpful, is to say whatever use they did continuously is what use they get to maintain. So if it's once a year to haul out the salt lick for the cattle, then it's once a year. Um, a more useful answer is to say um, it's what's reasonable in light of the circumstances. So if they build a house and it's the only driveway for the house and the driveway gets as used as often as the house gets used, then they have a right to use it as a driveway for a house. But if the house burns down for three years, the clock starts over again. So when you're dealing with impro access to improved property, the answer is fairly obvious. It's whatever use is associated with the improvement. And when you're dealing with agricultural problem, it can get, property can get more complicated. And where this is most important is when somebody has a prescriptive right to access one house, and then they want to split it into four and get four houses, that typically surcharges the prescriptive easement. Surcharge means to overuse. I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, I ask you some of the questions about a right away road. It's a private road. And uh, if, uh, if, if the people that are trying to stop the use on the private road, which many people are using, uh, and, uh, and they then uh, and they do a private, they do a notice on a, on a poll or something saying that this is a private road, we uh, want you to discontinue such and such time. How legal is that? I mean, if they haven't notified all 30, 30 people using it, they just have a public notice. That's enough to stake a claim. Um, and if you acquiesce in that claim by stopping to use the use um, or not otherwise recording the fact that you're ignoring it for five years, they can gain um, the rights. But in general, just posting the notice is just part of a case. It's not a case in and of itself. Um, but what I would do is, um, if there's any evidence on the sign as to who posted it, I'd send them a certified letter that says, I've noticed your posting. You should be aware that I've used that road to access my property for more than five years and I understand that I have a prescriptive right to use that road, and if you interfere with my right, I have the right to take action against you. I'd put that in writing, I'd send it certified, and I'd keep a copy. And then I'd continue to use the road. But where this usually comes up is, um, in 1978, we passed a little thing called Prop 13, which uh, reduced property taxes um, to local governments. This county chose at that point in time to stop accepting title to new roads. And as a result, most of the development and since 1978 is on streets that look to you and me like public streets. They're open, you can drive onto them, but the county doesn't own them or maintain them. That creates a whole class of roadways, the status of which is kind of ambiguous. Because number one, you've got an offer to dedicate. Normally when the subdivider created the subdivision, they offered to dedicate. And that acceptance of that offer of dedication is clearest when the county takes over maintenance responsibility. And if the county never takes over maintenance responsibility and 25 years later happens, then in theory the offer to dedicate goes away. But if the 
public has been making use of that road, or your neighbors have been making use of that road, or the people in the next subdivision have been using, making use of that road, then entirely apart from the county's relationship to the offer of dedication, they have a prescriptive right. So generally speaking, when you drive into a community like Wildwood West, where they've got signs every 10 feet saying, please drive more slowly than you think you should, um, or private road system, or strangers keep out, or um, abandon all hope ye who enter here, those signs may or may not mean very much. Um, generally what you'll see, if you've ever been in a big city and you're walking on the sidewalk and you see a little brass plate that says permission to pass uh, can be revoked on notice, that means that the, what appears to be a sidewalk is actually on the private property of the building owner. And in order to preserve their rights, they put the brass plate in. The other thing to do is once a year, they put up construction tape on the property line and block you. Once a year, you're blocked out. They're reasserting their right to own that land. There isn't a simple answer to your question. But from the facts that you describe them is other folks have used that road openly, continually, and hostily for a five-year period and have a prescriptive right to continue to do so. The association is trying to block the right. The road is violating the rights of those folks and cannot and should not do that. On the other hand, they, they, they will. I mean, people think they can. And your remedy is, one, is to bring a lawsuit to have a court declare that you have the rights that you have, and that will resolve it. Expensive. I don't recommend it. Two is to uh, try to reach agreement with the road association um, or the homeowners association, which I do encourage. And then three is just to engage in a little battle of wills. How often can they put boulders out there and how often can I drag them away, which I don't recommend because that generally will accelerate into um, something more unpleasant. Probably the best solution, and one of the reasons that road associations and homeowners associations behave the way they do, is that when you've got a road that's being maintained by a community and they're paying assessments every year to maintain it. And then you've got free riders who live around it who use it and are not paying. It sure burns people to be paying for a road and have somebody else tearing it up. From my perspective, the best solution is for everybody who benefits from the road to be in the club. Have a, a, an association of everybody who uses the road where everybody pays in. That's not that easy to accomplish because when people are getting a free ride, they want to take it. But the best solution, I think, is try to invite people into the club get a written agreement, have everybody contribute, and enlarge the club to the size necessary. Can I just pop in? One of our seminars later this year is going to be strictly on road associations because we get a lot of conflict around that. Yeah, this, this last week, there, there was a, in the newspaper, there was an article about somebody called to the Sheriff's Department about the rule I'm talking about, and there was a confrontation out there that, there's a couple people on this road that want to stop all traffic because of the death of what This is down off of Melody Lane, it's right? It's, it's off of uh, uh, it's, uh, Wild Turkey yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, Voyager I'm, Road. My barber talks to me about this. Uh, big old road and yeah. Yeah. Road. And anyway, so and, and there was like, uh, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 people there one night uh, removing the bowls, removing yeah. them off. And uh, the guy came that put the boulders there, and he was taking pictures of people's license plates, and then took pictures of people and stuff like that. And, and I mean, it's it's, 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 it's I, I I don't know where this is going to end up, but I I want I want to find out what to do to go I think all the folks who benefit from the road, who don't who across whose land it does not cross, should chip in and hire a lawyer, and have the lawyer persuade the guy who's blocking it to stop. And if you can go one step beyond that and get a recorded agreement saying everybody agrees that this road is open to these properties and then get that recorded, then you're in great shape. But it's hard to accomplish that because often each of you has an interest, but not so much of an interest that it makes sense for any one of you to pay for the lawyer. And you may not be able to collect enough people to pay for the lawyer. And this is one of those problems that until it gets a real legal solution, all it takes is one unreasonable person who doesn't want to know about the fact that you have a right and you get these flare-ups. And what the Sheriff's Department will do is they will tell you this is a civil matter. We will not intervene unless we see evidence that there's about to be violence and then we'll haul off the guy who's taking the swing. Yes, sir. As far as road maintenance, Mr. Larger is using the road over dying to get to some places to do some places. Now the motors come along and fix the road up to do things. They say, well, now that we've got this uh, ten thousand dollars that you cost in there, uh, we want you to pay some of our expenses to get the road or the repair it, and the logger says, "Hey, I didn't ask you to fix the road the perfect way it was before, and I'm not going to pay that." The logger's probably within his rights. 
He's not a good neighbor, but he's probably within his right. Yes, ma'am. He has the right to maintain a sewer line there because it's probably been there five years. Uh, he does not have the right to not repair the line. So you can demand that he repair the line. And if he doesn't repair it, then you've got two options. Your best option is to call the county and report the health hazard. And the county will red tag his house, or they can, um, and make him fix it. Your third option is to sue him to have a court order him to fix it. Your last option is to fix it yourself and send him a bill and try and collect. Um, what's nice about that is you get a solution right away. What's not nice about that is you probably donated the cost of the sewer repair. In the back. Okay, uh, you mentioned briefly about uh, the speed limit from the crash road, and we have an easement that's seven miles long that's property. And uh, what reason? Uh, one has 15 miles an hour, the next has 10, the next 5, and then you're back to 15. And All of those signs are on the course. And when I say they're unenforceable, they're unenforceable as a matter of civil law. They can be enforceable as a matter of CCNR. So the CCNR say it's a violation of these CCNRs and you can be fined if you drive faster than 15 miles an hour on such and such road. Then they can in fact fine you. That's a contract among the property owners. But as a matter of civil law, if you know, UPS truck is going too fast, they're not going to ticket him. Um, a road association has CCNRs by, de by definition, typically. It should be. Right. Among the property owners, not necessarily your guests. Well, and you could be, the CCNRs can make you responsible for your guests and invitees, which means if UPS tears up your neighborhood, you can hit the guy who had the delivery, in theory. Good luck with that one. Yes, ma'am. Um, the technical answer is that should be covered by your easement agreement. The practical answer is that it probably isn't. Um, and so you're left with what is the historic use of the road? What was the pattern of use over five years? Um, what I would do um, is try to do the neighborly thing um, and, and throw a barbecue and raise at the barbecue whether all of us should trim our oleanders just enough to let the vehicle through and try to, try to make it a neighborly sort of cajoled thing. You can also go to the road association, but it comes right down to it. If somebody's scratching up your RV just because they haven't maintained their, their shrubs, you can go down there with a trimmer and fix it. But the reason I'm not urging that is that you could go too far. I mean, if you, if you destroy their bushes wider than you really needed because you were in an enthusiastic mood that morning, then you violated their rights. So knowing where the line is, it's sort of hard to know. A judge is going to want to see that you behave reasonably. The best way to avoid a dispute, as I said, is to have a conversation first. Yes, sir. If you uh, allow a person to walk across your property, or your open property for five years or more, then you put up a fence. Uh, how long does he have? The same five years? Yes. Have? If he goes beyond the five years, his right. That's right. He, if he prescribes an easement, you can prescribe it back. Yes, ma'am. Um, they're going to be building behind my house, and. Where the builder is telling me the back property line is significantly different than what I was told. And he only showed me they exposed only one corner. Mm -hmm. there's, I don't know why there's even just two markers on one corner. But they didn't, along that back line where he's saying my property line is, they didn't expose the back corner. So what should I do? Because it's like... The cheap solution is a metal detector. Get a metal detector and go and go go look for the other monument. The 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 slightly more ex pull. You should have in some of the documents you got when you bought your land a depiction of your parcel, which will tell you its shape. And if you know a corner, then if it's a 90 degree angle, you should be able to measure x feet at a 90 degree angle from this line and find the other marker. Um, 
Yeah, start, start by looking at your parcel, try to find the other monument. If you can't find the other monument, then think about um, either getting a survey or going to the planning department that's issuing the permit for the new house and, and telling them you think there's a, a dispute here and that they should ask the builder to confirm the property line. It even seemed kind of funny when you were telling me, because the one you were citing, see this was cited, was this way, and the line is this way that you're saying is... I smell smoke, do you? Yeah, I smell smoke this time. I yes. just need to interject, and you're welcome to stay and answer questions as you're asking um, There may be a hearing at 1.30, we don't know. So, if it does, then what looks like litigants come in. <laughs> then we'll be done. Um, what, what did you say I should, so if I can't find it, then I should go to the planning? You, you can talk, talk to the planning department about your concerns. Whoever's issuing the approvals for the new house. And the other thing, Tell me a surveyor was coming out to look for that one property, the marker, and that bothered me too. I came home and then there's this thing. They're supposed to tell you. you know, that yes, ma'am? We have allowed our neighbors to use a little corner to access a couple of things. Because otherwise, you have to drive in at a different angle. And Just a friendly agreement. It's been more than five years, but now it's up for sale. And uh, they're advertising it as a place to put a big motor home, and which would be basically in our front yard. Are we required you to, need to do a to the listing broker that says, "Please be aware that our neighbor's right to do that was by our permission, and we reserve the right to revoke that permission, and we think that your your your, your listing of the property is misleading, and we request that it be corrected." Send it certified. Yes, yes, yes. Send it certified. Yep. And, uh, yes, uh, their permission, uh, can be in escrow for Fine, that works too. That works too. Yes, sir. Reference CTRs and, uh, uh, Community Service District and an association. What is the difference between those two? Um, uh, CCNRs are a private agreement among property owners that are enforceable among those property owners like any other contract. A community services district is a form of local government that might or might not have any authority over roads. It depends on which services it was established to perform. Very few community services districts provide law enforcement services. So if you're not providing law enforcement services, then you don't have much to say about this subject at all. Speed on your roads is set by the county or the city if you were in a city, and it's enforced by the sheriff's department. And an association an association is um, an entity that enforces CCNRs and is created by the CCNRs. You can think of the association as being the club and the CCNRs being the club's bylaws. Yes, sir. Recently, I uh, discovered uh, a neighbor's home, which was built in 1969. Uh, his parking area encroaches into my property uh, and it was hidden by berries. Uh, I bought the home in 85 and it was built in 80. Um, I'm looking for a solution. I just wondered, was there any liability with the original title company or refinance title company? Whoever sold it, you had to But the, it, any rights you have against them for non-disclosure didn't last for any longer than four years. Um, you do have a title insurance policy, and you should pull it out and look at it. Um, if you have a CTLA policy, it will exclude encroachments of that kind, and you will not have a right. It doesn't hurt to write them a letter and see if they'll fix it for you. Um, if you're an ATLA property, you probably are insured for that. So start by looking at your title insurance document and see what it says your rights are. You might very well have rights for an undisclosed encroachment that was existing at the time of the title insurance issue. Okay. Yes, sir, in the front row. I have a dream that I found out by a new neighbor attorney said illegal to bring him in. And it goes on to that off the set, the set off. It goes off to that, okay? So the minute he told me that, I went over and sealed it. And then I got the notice, you know, jail time, whatever it is, a couple weeks later or a week later, whatever it was. Uh, but I, when I found out that it was illegal, uh, my water is backing up, backing up. So now I've contacted uh, uh, the civil engineer, and I want to put the drain on my side of the property so the water... Well, what I'm afraid of is the water's got to go someplace. It's going to leach through anyway. Meanwhile, the water's wrecking my road, 
you know, four or five week wait period from the time it's approved, you don't have to go through and be approved. So legal rights over. I want to be a good neighbor. I'm not going to pull the plug. The last few guys have just pulled the plug because these wonderful people said I'm not illegal because it happened 15 years ago. But I know if I pull the plug, the water's going to go down and there's a swimming pool on a whole lake. What are my responsibilities? I want to put this in now, but it may also reach through and I'm paying for a new drainage uh, culvert you know, underneath my road. Well, I think that what I would do is talk to your civil and ask your civil engineer what the most reasonable thing to do in the short run is. And if your civil engineer says there's a whole lot less damage done to flood his back meadow than to flood your street, that might be a basis to go to the, the status quo ante. But the, when somebody comes to you and says your drain is illegal, but from my perspective, that's probably not true. Um, if the drain has been there for five years, then you have the right to... Yeah. But, you know, at some level what you're wrestling with here is the law of physics. Water flows downhill, and you're not in a position to redirect it yet, and you want to. Well, until you get to a place where you can redirect it, your choices are to back it up on your property or back it up on his property, but the water's got to go somewhere. And that's why I made it a practical problem, not a lawyer's problem. Talk to your engineer and ask him or her what the best short-term solution is. Pull the plug. I don't want to do that. That's, that's an engineering problem, not a lawyer. Or I think I'd talk to my neighbor about it. If your neighbor knows you want to do the right thing and you're planning to move the drain, maybe you can work something out in the meantime. Because if they were living with the problem for 15 years, maybe they can live with it for another 15 Where weeks. I would talk to them. Yes, ma'am. So you, there's, a, there's basically a, a Ford on your property that's been held open for public use for more than five years. Um, then the public has the right to continue using it. Um, I don't think you have very serious liability because if somebody breaks his neck out there, first of all, your homeowner's insurance will cover it. And second of all, they probably were acting unreasonably and therefore it's their problem. Um, so I don't think there's a great legal liability. It's more a question of um, quality of life because you've got noisy ATV traffic to deal with. I think what I would do is talk, the odds are that trail that leads to your Ford crossing goes on to public property at some point, um, either forest land or BLM land or park land. And so why are, why are ATVs using it? Who are they? Are they neighbors? What I mean, it's, what you might do is gate it and share the key to the gate with the immediate stakeholders. Um, and if that's up for five years, then that's legal. Um, so if you cut a deal with the folks who have an immediate stake and it's legal with the planning agency to put the gates up and you share, one way to do it is just have two locks, you and your neighbor, so you can unlock your lock and get in, and then you lock it to their lock and they unlock their lock and they can get in. That two lock solution is easier than sharing keys. Um, technically, you're probably violating prescriptive rights of the public at large, but your average 16-year-old ATV driver hasn't talked to me lately and doesn't know, so five years from now your problem goes away. But you do want to consult with the people whose property is affected by it. But generally when you're dealing with recreation traffic, they're going a long distance. That's what they like to do. And they're going to get onto public property at some point. If you can talk to the public property agency, there may be a, an ability to make that trail less attractive by using the agency's power on its land. So there's more than one way to skin this particular cat. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a building with a deep roof. And I own two walls. And people on either side are just fighting against my wall. And they have complained that water was getting into their building. Mm -hmm. So am I supposed to take care of their drainage and their... Your, your, your building was there first? Yeah. But then they needed to design around you. They have to put their wall up or what? The, 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 there's a, I mean, I don't know what the solution is but they needed to design around you. They needed to take your facts into consideration. 
and if they built a building that lends itself to damage because of how your building always drained, they bought that problem. Yes, sir. Back to the ATVs and stuff, uh, we get to the community service district and a lot of the young people out there ride dirt bikes. And uh, a month or so ago, one of them took a spill there. He got road rash real bad. His helmet hit a rock, fortunately, he was with a helmet. And it, it's a dirt road. It's got culverts. Some drop off uh, four or five feet. Public agencies have what's called trail immunity. If you get injured on a trail, you cannot sue the public agency that owns the trail because trails are supposed to be inherently dangerous. And if you choose the risk of that sport, you choose the risk of that sport. So I got a trail that crosses through one of the cities that I represent to park onto the national park land. And an old cattle um, barbed wire sort of juts out into the trail and back in again because it's just how it is. Somebody on a mountain bike didn't see it and tangled himself in the barbed wire and did a whole lot of damage to himself. He sued my agency and everyone within 100 feet of my agency, and we got out on demur because there's trail immunity. What about the parks? Um, if it's a, it, we got 64 parks on six miles of road. If if it's a road that you own, you're responsible if it's unreasonably dangerous. If it's a trail, then there's trail immunity. Generally, if vehicles are using it, it's not a trail; it's a road, and it it can't be unreasonably dangerous. But if the dangers are apparent, like it's a bumpy, bumpy gravel road that doesn't have any fresh gravel on it, and anybody who's got both eyes open can figure that out, and they get injured because they've, they've not used that road reasonably, you should win that lawsuit, but you still can get sued. The, you've got a lot of curves where you can't see around them until you get there. We've got hills that you can't see over. That's probably something where you need a little signage. And you might want to, first of all, your CSD your, your is probably in a risk pool for insurance. You and you might want to consult the risk pool about what they advise. If you can't get advice from your risk pool, you might want to spend a little bit of money on a registered traffic engineer to do a signing program for you and put the signs up and maintain them. I'd start with the risk pool because you've already paid for their advice. Yes, sir. In terms of ordinary use and ingress and egress, somebody owns some property, has their neighbor, he's buying the property, the person he's sold it to, he had to find their awareness, he has to figure out ordinary use. Only by the landlord. That person then sells the property to a second person. That person now wants to log his property. And the original seller says you can't use that property except for the only time owner for ordinary use. It's ordinary use and it's timberland. If, if it's timberland, then logging is an ordinary use. It's going to be related to the lawful uses of land. And if it's zoned for timber harvesting and they have a timber harvesting permit, that's probably going to be ordinary use. Yes, ma'am. If the drainage has functioned like that for more than five years, they probably have a right to continue to drain that way. And your, your best solution is for you to install the protective drainage devices on your side of the line. If they just recently repaid it and changed the drainage, then you can force them to fix it. I would start by going to the planning counter and asking what's in the planning file on the business that has the parking lot. And there may well be a drainage system that they were required to build and didn't, but they were required to maintain and haven't. But I'd start by going to the planning counter of the appropriate city or town or county. Yes, sir. You should order them to put it back. And they may have to pay a surveyor to do it. They were not allowed to remove the marker. It's a crime. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, about a year ago, somebody bought the parcel next to it. We're in town. And they're wanting to build a house on it, but it was an old mine site. And we had some uh, engineering done, and there are a lot of toxic waste on it. We, as property owners right next to it, we would just like to have this left alone. Um, do we have rights? Um, yes and no. Uh, you do have rights, but so does he. He owns the property and is entitled to make a reasonable use of it. He has to use it in a way that complies with the environmental laws. So what, um, he, they can't like stir up the asbestos and blow it at your house. Well, it's um, what, uh, there, are, there are going to be legally approved ways to mitigate the arsenic. 
And what I would do is talk, start with the, at the planning counter. If you need to talk to the Regional Water Control Board in Sacramento, you can do that too. But find out what the rules are. And then if you know what the rules are, you can tell whether his contractor is following the rules or not. And if they're not following the rules, make them stop. But the rules are designed for your protection. And they may not make you feel absolutely safe, but if they're the publicly adopted rules, they're the ones they've got to follow. Yes, ma'am. If it's a recorded easement, you can only buy it back. If it's a prescriptive right, it disappeared after five years of non-use. Looks like we're uh, running out of steam. Any last questions? Yes, sir. Energy has a uh, uh, target system off. They have um, a spillway on my property, and they have a spillway in front of my property. Uh, some years, they check the spillway in front of my property and divert that water that comes off the wolf mountain, and some years, they forget to do it. This year, they forgot to do it and washed out my road. Um, uh, a lot of Get an estimate of the cost of repair and make a claim against the district for that cost. Yeah. And they'll have a claim form which you have to fill out and sign. And you have to do that within six months of the accident. I bet you if you if I bet you if you send them a bill for five thousand dollars worth of gravel, that they'll be suddenly more receptive to your suggestion that they ought to fix the check. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, uh, you see the neighbor parking five feet in my park hole. It's been there for thirty-five years. I have a piece of third owner. I have a you know a dialogue relationship with them. I mean, if, if you're happy with the situation, I, I'd let it be. Um, if well, will it cloud my deed if I go to um, sell it or? Is no, it's a disclosure. When you go to sell, you got to disclose. Yeah. But you bought the house, seeing what you saw, yeah, and, and we're happy to live there. And yeah, it's a disclosure issue. But if if you're happy, and your quality of life is not impaired, why open that box? Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.